welcome to Comic Island. My name is Arden, and today we're checking in with Infinity Wars. So, Marvel's big new crossover event is up and running, officially, as of last week. After a whole bunch of issues building up to it, which we'll get into in this uh, video, we finally have issue 1 coming out as of uh, last week, I believe, and I gotta tell you guys, we have a Marvel event that doesn't totally suck. It's it's actually pretty enjoyable on the whole, and I think I would recommend you check it out. Let's get into this a bit, because it is probably worth your time. So the Infinity Gems are back, after effectively being either destroyed or disappearing during the events of Time Runs Out, they've returned post-Secret Wars for the first time in this brand new world created by Molecule Man. As such, the gems are different. The rules about them and what they can do no longer apply, and our heroes and the various villains in the Marvel Universe have to grapple with this as they vie for the gems themselves. This is an actual big event that I quite enjoy on the whole. Written by Jerry Duggan, this guy really shows some new colors in this story and essentially writes a big event in a way that so many other big prolific writers at Marvel have failed time and time again before. I am very specifically thinking of people like Nick Spencer or Brian Michael Bendis who really fail to deliver in a big exciting way when it comes to their big crossover events. Duggan is on form here, and for somebody who is primarily known as a Deadpool writer, boy oh boy does he know how to write his way around other characters and teams as well as just a much more serious story. There's a lot of humor throughout Infinity Wars that we've seen so far, to the extent I was a little worried at first. In the first issue of Countdown, Drax rips the wings off of these aliens and tries to use them himself, and he's flapping his wings like a crazy person, which theoretically is funny, but I was just like, oh my god, they're ruining Drax's character. <laughs> because between all the stuff we get with Drax, you know, and his he doesn't get idioms, they're going in the too far with this, and now he's just like a big dumb guy, and haha, isn't that funny, except for we're forgetting how serious and awesome this character is. But I think within the same issue, or if not one issue later, Drax then proceeds to crash a ship on somebody and emerge from the wreckage like the true and proper destroyer that he is. So it's not like we've gone too far with this character. In fact, that's the only joke that doesn't really work for me. There's a nice amount of humor throughout this series so far, but not too much to override the relatively serious tale we're going with, as well as the serious nature of the events going on, and the fun action that's coming out of all of this too. It's a good balance. Yes, there is still some humor throughout all of it, and sometimes it doesn't work, but other times it really does. Drax starts to take to playing the saxophone throughout the story, and at one point is able to use the power gem with it, it's very cool what they kind of do with that stuff, and I really like the event as a whole. It's doing a lot of interesting things right now. The best part of this event is it isn't a carbon copy of Infinity War either. We're doing something very different this time around, signified most easily by the fact that Thanos is killed in the prime issue leading up to the main event itself. Countdown and that Prime comic are an awesome introduction to this series, and part of the reason why I'm pretty excited about this event as a whole. Because when we look back at something like Secret Invasion or Civil War II, those both had a pretty strong start to them. It was only later that things started to fall apart, but here's a key difference between this event and those. The five issues leading up to this, as well as the Prime comic, are really good all into themselves. If they were modified ever so slightly to be a standalone story, I would be 100% satisfied with it as it exists. Issue number 3 of Countdown ends like a big crossover event would normally in another story. There's a huge big planetary conflict, characters are seemingly killed, there's a big epic ending to it, Drax gets to wail on his saxophone in a huge significant way that actually defeats a major villain, and it's all so great. But that's just issue 3 of a 5 part series, and things just keep going and keep escalating until we get to issue number 1 of Infinity Wars, and once again, we get to see Jerry Duggan really avoid some of the other pratfalls these events fall into time and time again. 
So instead of us constantly and pointlessly building up the secret identity of this new Requiem character, we find out who it is in this first issue right away, which is good because who it is is who everyone thought it would be, and that's Gamora. But it's not a future version of Gamora like I assumed. It's the present day Gamora, who's got a real axe to grind with these Infinity Stones and is fully prepared to turn on all her friends and the Guardians in order to get access to the soul gem and the world contained within it, fight this mysterious and terrifying being that's somehow taken residence within the soul gem, and then regain a part of herself that was lost within that gem as well. There's multiple factors going on here that make this not a huge heel turn for this character. For one thing, we don't know what's happened to her in terms of what the soul gem did to this character. She might very well be corrupted by this thing that is inside of it. It seems that way, and it nicely mirrors the life and what happened to her father. Gamora's on her own mad quest now, and she's fully willing to kill the people she loves for it, as we see when she strikes down Peter Quill in a big way within issue one. Look, this isn't perfect. It's doing the thing that all the events always do, where they kill off characters and that sort of thing. But at least, much like Secret Wars, there's a built-in reset button to this thing that doesn't feel so egregious. We can go places in terms of what these Infinity Gems can do and what's going to happen next, and we know those gems are powerful enough that they can kind of undo some of the bigger deaths and changes that happen as a result of this event. It already happened once when Doctor Strange and Adam Warlock go to investigate the Soul Gem, and Adam Warlock goes into the gem only for his powers to immediately disappear and this being just slaughters him in mere seconds. The only reason that he's still alive is because Doctor Strange happens to have the time gem and was able to undo the event just before it actually happened. But it gets into the whole nature of this event. We're gonna just go places and you just have to kind of be on board. Loki has a really interesting and weird story that digs into the concept of the multiverse itself as well as what these Infinity Gems are going to be used for and needed in the coming days within this event itself. It's all very cool, as are the bearers of the gem. Doctor Strange puts together a new version of the Infinity Watch, and we have characters like him controlling the gem, which is a pretty standard affair, as well as Adam Warlock. But then we have newcomers, like a new version of Stiltman, who brings together a bunch of villains to this meeting and is like, oh, you're gonna have to negotiate with me. I have the mind gem. I wanna be taken seriously. Everyone better take me seriously, kind of thing. Which is quite entertaining in and of itself. Then we have characters like Black Widow back, which unfortunately kind of undermines the whole point of character death. That's kind of a separate issue that Marvel hasn't really reconciled with here, is how do you have stakes in a story like this without it feeling meaningless. But I contend to you, even in a story like this where we know everything can be undone, just like in Avengers Infinity War where we know all those deaths can be undone, there's still significance within the story itself. As long as you're on board and enjoying your time here, then it doesn't really matter if technically the stakes aren't really there. Because it's fun. Obviously it's fiction, you can break it down to any story that it doesn't really matter, who, who cares? The point is the journey, and so far this journey is amazing. I'm really enjoying myself so far, a lot more than I expected to, and I had pretty high hopes for Jerry Duggan doing something at least different than what we usually get out of these events, and that's not only what we got, but I've been so impressed by his willingness to do things like in his own way and strike his own path. A lot of people are going to look at these events, and you can see in these comics the attempts to steer the overall canon ever so slightly towards the MCU once more. Personally, I would argue it's a good way to draw new readers in and that sort of thing, and they don't do it to an extent that's overly offensive. But the other thing that they also do is that Jerry Duggan clearly isn't afraid to make changes when he wants to, in spite of what comic book fans and people who only know the comic books and these characters from the movies might think. So the group talks again, and it's important to say again because to a lot of moviegoers they're gonna be like, what are you talking about? Groot only ever says I am Groot. But that's a, that's a change that happened to his character over time, which this comic is smart enough to acknowledge when they essentially restore Groot to his original form. So we have a walking, talking Groot once more, and it's really interesting to get into his personality in a way that we don't often get to see when he just goes, I am Groot, over and over again. Galactus was briefly a life-bringer. 
not a devouring world at all, only for him to eventually return to normal during the events of Countdown and Silver Surfer to be renamed his Herald. The point being is that these changes aren't happening in one universal direction. Sometimes we're going back to original things, sometimes we're moving in a new direction with characters. It's all over the place, which is great because it makes it very difficult to predict what's going to happen next. And I kind of love the event for all these reasons. It's going its own direction, it's doing its own thing, and yeah, it's not perfect, but who cares because it's entertaining and difficult to predict. Add to that, Mike Diodato is drawing this main core series, and his artwork is as phenomenal as always. He's got a real strong sense of realism, which gives these scenes a lot of weight. In terms of artwork, it unsurprisingly reminds me a lot of Original Sin. And the overall look of this comic, but even just the tendency of these characters to all go off in their own little adventures and stories, is great and adds a lot to the series. It feels like everyone's involved in this thing without it being too crowded either. The main focus is on these Infinity Watch characters, but the others definitely show up and the Guardians have their own big role in all of this. So it's a pretty fun event on the whole. I'm very curious where things go from here. I absolutely love how they aren't taking obvious routes or directions with things and kind of carving their own path with everything. And on the whole, it's a very cool story I don't have a lot of predictions for, just because it's so interesting and different. It's also kind of telling that the Fantastic Four are coming back right around this time, since they will have a very direct knowledge about how this universe was formed and what those gems are all about. So I don't know what's happening going forward, and I like that I don't know. I'm super excited about this event, in a way that I haven't been about any major Marvel event since pretty much uh, the Secret Wars event a few years ago. And look, Civil War II and Secret Invasion had a very strong start to them. That first issue of both those events was pretty good and set up the event in a pretty big way. But here's the thing, and one of the reasons I'm a little more excited about this than the others. If we take the five countdown issues, that Prime comic, and the first issue of Infinity Wars all in itself, it's a pretty satisfying story all on its own. We aren't building up endlessly. It feels like this first issue kicks off the event and we're just gonna blaze forward and who knows what's gonna happen next. And that's exciting because pretty much the first issue did everything I expected the entire event to do. Killing off a random character, revealing who Requiem is, setting up this bigger threat for them to face. That's the sort of stuff that would take either half the event or the majority of the event if someone like Brian Michael Bendis wrote it. But this is issue number one, and we cover all that ground right away, letting us dive into whatever's coming and whatever Duggan has planned next. And that's all uncharted territory. It's new gems, new rules, there's nothing in the comics that can really let you predict what's going to happen next. And yes, there is that built-in undo button because of the Infinity Gems, just like with Secret Wars, but like I said, if that journey is all set up, if it's all ready to go, and we can just enjoy the story for what it is, then it doesn't matter that there's an undo button. It doesn't matter that Peter Quill's death probably doesn't truly mean anything at the moment. Because it's all just fun in and of itself, and I'm enjoying the journey so much already. Meanwhile, the gems themselves are fascinating in this story. There's a new angle to them that's presented in this comic and the series as a whole that I find quite interesting. Namely the idea that these gems are almost like the Ring of Power in Lord of the Rings or something like that. Constantly changing hands, Rocket constantly complaining that you can't sell these things because they're just so dangerous and powerful nobody really wants them, and anyone powerful enough to afford them would probably just take them from you. They're almost like those bandanas in Afro Samurai as well, where there's just this trail of blood and bodies following each of the gems as they change hands before someone either inevitably tries to protect them or use them, only for someone else to come along and either take the gem, kill the user, or find some other way around obtaining them themselves. This idea of this never-ending path of death and destruction following the gems wherever they go is a fascinating one. An idea that I hope they are going to build up on going forward because it's an interesting aspect of these artifacts that I quite enjoy. The angle Jerry Duggan's taking with this is very cool. It's something that's kind of always existed with the gems, but I think he does a really good job in explaining them. 
Um, Star-Lord at the beginning of this story really says it well, where he's just acknowledges that this gem will essentially be the death of him, but he feels he has no choice. It's either protect it or let it fall in the hands of someone far more malicious with the gem. So he chooses to protect it, and it ultimately, Gamora is the one who strikes him down. It's grim and bleak and terrifying, and kind of a really cool take on the Infinity Stones, one that we don't get to see enough of normally. I will warn you, no matter how you start reading this comic, unless you go back to like the very beginning of the Guardians run and start reading all these other extra comics, you're probably going to be a little lost. Countdown itself just sort of throws you into the deep end. And it's like, well, I hope you know what's going on with the Nova Corps. I hope you know Richard Rider's back. I hope you know that Galactus is turned into a good guy for a brief period of time. I hope you know that Groot starts this as baby Groot at the beginning of this story, which really had me worried, by the way. You just kind of have to accept everything that's thrown at you, assume it's been covered earlier, and just enjoy it. Because once you're kind of at least vaguely on the level of understanding what's going on, which I did more than I didn't, then... It's a cool story. It's really interesting and blew me away in some big ways, especially Countdown. Countdown's really good. Nicely sets up this event, and even if you just read Countdown all on its own, it would totally be worth it. So yeah, check something out to get an idea of whether or not you might like this event, because I am enjoying the crap out of it so far. So thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. If you like Comic Island, be sure to check out our Patreon page in the video description. And finally, don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics.